With these leaves on the hill, there may be a America's Funniest Home Video moment coming. I almost slipped coming up before, so uh, this could be entertaining today. Good to see you all. Welcome. Happy to have you here. And uh, the sun is coming out. It was supposed to be 53 degrees at 10 o'clock. So I hope that's what it feels like. Uh, Operation Christmas Child Boxes are due back today. If you have not brought them back today, you can certainly bring them to the church office the next couple of days uh, as they will be sent off to where they need to go. Uh, Thanksgiving Eve, we will have a 7 o'clock service in the main sanctuary. That's uh, 7 o'clock on Thanksgiving Eve. Uh, in the parish news, there is information if you're interested in purchasing uh, Christmas wreath from the, uh, wreaths from the Boy Scout Troop 474. Uh, fill out that information and get it back to the church office <coughs> Excuse me, as soon as possible. Uh, because, and there's a deadline date on that also. We're going to have a congregational meeting where we will approve, uh, present and approve the 2021 uh, financial budget as well as elect our council leaders. Uh, so we'll get closer to that. We'll give you information. We're going to do it a hybrid. If you can be here, great. If we can do it on Zoom, we'd love to have your input that way also. And don't forget the Wednesday night service continues uh, each week at 7 o'clock. Uh, and it's about 15, 20 minutes long in the main sanctuary. And there's plenty of room to social distance and be comfortable. And two weeks from today, we will be uh, moving back inside. The party's got to end sometime, folks. And uh, uh, two weeks from today is the first Sunday of Advent. That's Thanksgiving weekend. And what we will be doing is we'll be returning to the 830 service. And then we will move the 10 o'clock service back to 1030. That will give us more than enough time to uh, sanitize and clean in between the services uh, in the sanctuary. We purchased uh, a mister as well as other things and uh, your health and safety is our top priority and we will be able to do that. And by having the two services plus the Wednesday night service, we're hopefully gonna be able to ac accommodate you comfortably um, as we move back inside. I'm hoping that the weather next week will be good for one more week, then we'll have been out here for six months. So uh, I think that's pretty good. God has blessed us during this challenging and difficult time. So two weeks from today, there'll be a, a viewpoint, a newsletter going out in the mail this week and by email, it's got a lot of details on all of these things and uh, upcoming uh, events in the months ahead. All right, so it is the second to last Sunday of the church year, the 24th Sunday after Pentecost and uh, let us take a moment of silent prayer and then we'll join together in the gathering on page two. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. You have been our good and faithful master. Our Heavenly Father has done wonderful things for us. He has given us more than we could ever ask or imagine. Yet there have been times when we have been ungrateful for God's gifts, times when we have been lazy and selfish with what he has given us, times when we have been unfaithful servants. Yet our Heavenly Father invites us to return to him and ask for his forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we confess that we have not been faithful with all of the good gifts that you have given us. We have sinned in our thoughts, words, and actions. We have failed by our inactivity. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, O Lord, that we might be restored as your servants. Beloved, God is gracious and merciful. Therefore, it is my honor to declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Righteous God, our merciful master, you own the earth and all its peoples, and you give us all that we have. Inspire us to serve you with justice and wisdom and prepare us for the joy of the day of your coming. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first reading this morning is taken from the book of Psalms, the 90th chapter. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth, or the land and the earth were born, from age to age, you are God. You turn us back to the dust and say, turn back, O children of earth. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. 
You sweep them away like a dream. They fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning, it is green and flourishes. In the evening, it is dried up and withered. For we are consumed by your anger. We are afraid because of your wrath. Our iniquities you have set before you and our secret sins in the light of your countenance. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is taken from 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief for you are all children of light and children of the day we are not of the night or of darkness so then let us not fall asleep as others do but let us keep awake and be sober for those who sleep sleep at night and those who are drunk get drunk at night but since we belong to the day let us be sober and put on the breast the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation for God has destined us not for wrath but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep we may live with him therefore encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are doing the word of the Lord to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents but the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went, and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one uh, with the ten talents. For to all who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for the worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated as I invite forward our children. All right. 
I have giveaways today, so. All right, what do we got? They're yours to keep. Now, what do we do with apples? We eat them, right? That's the primary thing we do with apples, right? But that's not the only thing you can do with an apple, right? So you can eat the apple. What else can you do with the apple? You can roll it down, but we don't want to do that. We want to use it for what it's good for, right? You can take the seeds out and you can plant the seeds. And what'll happen if you plant the seeds? It'll grow a tree and what'll grow on the tree? more apples ah you can also give away the apple right this is exactly what jesus was talking about in the gospel lesson he tells this story about these these guys with money he gives to one man he gives five to another one he gives two and to another one he gives one and the one with the five he goes out he doubles it comes back with ten to the master the one with the two doubles it comes back with four to the master but with the one with the one he comes back with one he didn't double it. He didn't make any more money. You know what he did? He just dug a hole, put it in the ground, and left it there. And Jesus tells this story because Jesus gives us all sorts of good gifts, all sorts of blessings in life. And what Jesus expects us to do is not just merely take it, bury it in the ground, or eat it for ourselves. Jesus expects us to double it, to give it to others, to make a blessing out of it. So God gives us apples, right? God gives us the beauty of his creation. God gives us all these blessings. God gives us our faith. And God doesn't just want us to use it for ourselves. He wants it to grow. So we take care of God's creation, right? We don't just waste things. We don't just throw them out. We do our best to help the world around us grow and be better. And it's the same with our faith life. Jesus gives us his love. He gives us the Bible. He gives us our church family. And he expects us not only to hear for ourselves, what God gives to us and how much God loves us by giving Jesus to die and rise for us. But he also expects us to share the good news, to tell others. That was the message that Jesus was giving today, right? So enjoy your apples, eat them later when your parents say it's okay. And you know, if you can plant and grow an apple tree and have more apples, good job, right? How about a prayer together? Dear God, thank you for all the gifts you give to me. Help me to use these blessings and multiply them so others can see your love. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys have been great today. Enjoy the apples. The status quo. That's an old ancient Latin phrase that began to be used in English speaking circles in the early 1700s. It's basically a Latin phrase that describes the current state of affairs. It's another way of saying the way things are normal or the way things currently are and you expect them to be. And I think when you think about the status quo and you think about most people, especially Americans, we are people that really enjoy the status quo. We don't really like change. Change sometimes can be a very hard and challenging thing for us. And it can especially be challenging and difficult for us when it's an unexpected or an unwelcome change, right? Something that goes against everything that had been normal and moving along as we had expected it to be in our lives. And I think from a certain perspective, as we think about this year's presidential election, it really was about that question of the status quo. Were we going to continue with a president who was anything but the status quo in every single behavior and way and manner? Or we'd, we as a country go back to what had been the status quo, somebody who'd been part of government in Washington for a long time and had been vice president. And, and I think that the world and, and American citizens wrestled with that as they went to the ballot box. 
And if you think about 2020, 2020 has been an incredible challenge to the status quo. The way things were, what was the status quo in January and February, is nothing like it is now. And we keep hearing that phrase, the new normal, trying to get us to accept that this might be the new status quo in the way we live. But certainly 2020 has reminded us that for as much as we may enjoy the status quo, it is not guaranteed. It may not always be that way. And for me personally, as I've looked at my ministry over the last few years, I've noticed the development of a newer status quo when it comes to faith in the church that for me I find very disturbing. The church and spirituality and the role of organized religion in our lives and in society today has become less and less important. It's become less and less part of the normal walk of our daily lives. It's less and less called upon and expected to make a difference and speak out to us in so many different ways. And in, in some ways, the church and faith has become non-essential in the lives of many people. You don't have to look very further than the events of the last few months to see how that has happened. In the face of this world-threatening virus that we've been dealing with, the church in so many different ways has had to stop people from gathering the way they normally would to hear the promises of God's presence and God's blessings. It's been a challenge for us to meet God's people in the midst of the anxiety and the struggles that they've been facing because of this threatening virus. And then the unthinkable happened when government and authority declared the church and her leaders to be non-essential while continued to say that liquor stores were essential businesses that needed to be open. I never thought I would see the day where my vocation and calling would be non-essential. But I guess I shouldn't be surprised because that's been the trend that's been going on in society and the world over the last couple of decades. The role and the place of God and faith and religion has declined and declined and declined. And this new status quo where faith and a journey with God is less influential and less important in life, I think has greatly contributed to many of the tensions and the divisions that we're experiencing in life in the world today. That not hearing about the importance of loving and forgiving one another has caused so much of this one-upmanship and this harsh, brutal tone that has created so much anxiety, so much division, so much pain among us in society today. At least it was a few, several decades ago, where even if somebody considered themselves not the most religious person in the world, we still all had a common moral compass. Pretty much everyone knew and lived by the Ten Commandments. Nowadays, you're hard-pressed to find people who can even name the Ten Commandments, no less live by them. And with that, decrease of influence of those types of teachings that God has given to us that used to permeate, permeate the structure of society. Also, what has been lost is the belief that there is life after death and that when we are called to this life after death, there won't be some sort of eternal, eternal accounting for our behaviors as we live life in this world. So now that we've taken the seal, the sealing off our expected human behaviors because we don't have to worry about any sort of eternal judgment, now horrible, questionable human behavior has become more and more commonplace in the world and in our lives. And even some of the most foundational and important institutions that we have in society have now begun to act in a soulless, anything goes type of way with their behavior. You need to look no further than government to see this going on. And what has the decrease of the influence of God and the church had on our educational systems and on the family structure? In so many different ways, the status quo of the church in the 2000s has been on a steady decline. We see it in the numbers of attendance in church. We see it and how little influence the voice of the church 
and spirituality has in the lives of God's people. And I don't think this is a good thing because with it has come a decline of society, of human behavior, of the respect and the care that we have for one another. As Jesus tells this parable of the talents in the gospel lesson, he is saying no more to the status quo. No more are we called as God's people to just bury it in the ground and keep it for ourselves. No more are we just to hide behind it as though I've got my life for myself, but I'm not or I'm afraid to share it with others. No, he holds out the one with the five talents and the two talents as a reminder to us that when we receive the benefits and the blessings of God's love and God's kingdom, we are called and it is vital for the health and the life of the world that we magnify it, that we multiply it, that we share it and we become light in the midst of the darkness. Because as much as we may love the status quo, sin and brokenness are constantly challenging and breaking apart the status quo. That's what Paul was getting at in our epistle lesson to the Thessalonians. He just said, he said, just when you're getting to the point where you're comfortable and secure, destruction breaks in. That's the result of this broken, sin-filled world that we live in. But he says, we are not those of the dark, those who bury it in drunkenness. We bury our heads in the sand. We bury the talent in the ground. No, we are those of the light. We have hope. We need not fear because God's presence in our lives changes our perspective. And as a result of that, we become the light for others to help them see in the darkness. But in order to do this, we must be conditioned and energized by our presence in God's gifts. We must hear and receive over and over those blessings and promises that God gives to us. For you cannot be light in the darkness if you haven't charged up the batteries or you don't know where to find the flashlight. So God calls us to take those blessings, to take those talents, to take those gifts, to charge them up in God's presence and magnify them and enlighten the world around us. This whole idea of status quo is deceiving. Because of the imperfection and the brokenness of the world, things are constantly changing and they are constantly in flux. But we don't need to fear this because as St. Paul pointed out for us, by the gifts of faith that God gives to us, we have the breastplate of love and faith, and we put on the helmet of the hope of salvation. God protects us, God empowers us, and strengthens us to go forward. And God does this for us, because we are anything but status quo to our Lord. So cherished and loved and valuable we are, that our Lord was willing to go up against the status quo to give his son to die and rise for us. So therefore, we don't live empty, boring, meaningless lives, but we do exactly what the psalmist called us to do today. We number our days and we live our lives applying the wisdom of the Lord. Amen.
this blast assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. Beloved, let us confess our triumphant Christian faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Beloved, in our prayers this morning, we remember Christopher Ardito, uh, the son of Betty Corwin. We also remember Dana Wade and Dana, the family of Dana Wade. Dana was tragically called to her eternal home this week. A funeral, a funeral service, or actually a viewing, will be at Brueggemann Funeral Home for Dana on Tuesday from 2 to 4 p.m. and then from 7 to 9 p.m. with a funeral for Dana here at St. Paul's on Wednesday at 11 a.m. Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all those in need. Lord of the church, ignite your people with the passion of your love. By the fire of your Holy Spirit, help us to never take for granted your gift of faith. Empower us to multiply your gifts so that the world would know your comfort when the status quo is interrupted. Hear us, O God. Lord, raise up good and faithful servants in the governments of this world, that citizens of all nations might be treated with fairness and justice. Continue to promote peace and calmness as we negotiate this time after the election. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of all need, search out all who cry to you in distress. 
scatter the heavy clouds of depression, chronic illness, unemployment, and loneliness with your radiant light. Bless especially this day we pray you, Christopher, the family of Dana, Evelyn, Cecile, Tyler, Linda, Kyle, Jonathan, Mackenzie, Madeline, Brett, Anne, Jan, Melissa, Claire, Carol, Violet, Robert, Roy, June, Bill, Karen, Carl, Carla, Kevin, Paul, Bob, Mitch, Chloe, Charlie, Everett, Joan, Don, Betty, Jack, Linda, Artie, Andy, Linda, Angela, and all those we now name silently before you in our hearts. Send us encouragement and signs of your healing. Hear us, O God. Lord, the day of Jesus' return is drawing near. Give us patience and faith as we await his return. Embolden us to serve our neighbors and never grow weary of doing good. Hear us, O God. Lord, by the resurrection of your son, death has been destroyed. Yet each human being still faces earthly death. We bring before you all those who are mourning the deaths of loved ones, especially the family of Dana. Comfort them with the hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Hear us, O God. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when you gather all creation around your throne where you will live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right to give our thanks and praise. it is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of creation, for you have had mercy on us and given us your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment you, con you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son Jesus Christ our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption that you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given it to his disciples, he said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, given and shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Lord, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Savior of the world. Amen. For God has loved us so much that he has given us his Son to be our Savior. And now, therefore, as God's beloved children, we have the courage to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>
Take and eat this is the body of Christ given for you.